Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, when we look back on the last week of November 2019, there will be a lot of reasons why we remember that specific time period, and this is one of them. The map you're looking at here is looking at maximum 10-meter wind gusts that we saw between the 24th of November and the 1st of December. And as you look at this, remember, 10 meters about 30 feet above our heads. Look at this color here. That represents the 50 to 55 mile an hour wind gust range. And you can see how much of the United States is covered with that color. We saw some incredibly windy conditions through the midsection of the United States. States, and it all started with a few powerful systems that came in here into the West Coast, specifically this one here that hit coastal Oregon and also parts of California here, where offshore wind speeds approached 100 miles an hour. So it wasn't just the winds we're going to remember last week for, it's also the precipitation. Now, each one of those systems as they came into California dropped a lot of rainfall and a lot of mountain snow. We're going to take a closer look at that in a few moments. But as each system kind of pulled out of the West and moved toward the Northeast, we saw big time snows here on the north side of it and very heavy rainfall. You can see here in parts of Illinois, southern Illinois, southern Indiana, but also Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, and even getting down into parts of northern Mississippi and Alabama, several locations here picking up between three and six inches of total accumulated precipitation just over the last week. But take a look at the last system that went through here in terms of total snowfall. We are adding to our yearly snowfall amounts right now in some locations over a foot from this last system. We're packing it into the mountains finally, but each system coming out in the Great Plains dumping quite a bit of snow. So this is the map that really just kind of boggles my mind. This is total accumulated snowfall from September 30th up until Sunday, December the uh, 1st. And when you look at this particular map, there are parts of Montana, Wyoming, parts of the Dakotas that have already seen four feet of snow. And there are still crops that must be harvested in this area. But we are packing that snow up in the western part of the United States as well, and that's quite important for this time of year. So let me at least show you that because in terms of the water health out west, we need to be seeing these numbers stay at or very close to 100. What are they? It's the basin average snow water content, and it's expressed in a percent of normal. So when you look at it, anything at 100 or above would mean that they've got more snow, more, more snow than normal. About the only places that have been relatively dry in terms of snowfall have been parts of Wyoming, excuse me, not Wyoming, but Idaho, uh, Washington, and Oregon. And that's because we've had this flow pattern that's been doing quite a bit of this very wavy high uh, over low setup. So we have brought in quite a bit of snow, though, into California. The four reporting stations here in the northern Sierra Nevada, uh, better than 75%, some of them reporting over 100%. And that's important to understand these snowfall amounts in California. I just want to show you something quite neat here. Sacramento, California, we're going to go from Shingle Springs here to Camino. Now that's going in elevation over a 17 mile drive. You're going to go from 1400 feet to 3100 feet. And during that drive, that change in elevation means everything for precipitation. So in Shingle Springs, they got one and a half inches of rainfall. Uh, here in Placerville, which is halfway in between, they started to see the snow. But by the time we got to Camino, we now have well, well in excess of a foot out of this last system. I want to thank Dana for sending these great pictures to me over the weekend to kind of show me what that elevation dependent snowfall looks like. Well, just keeping on track with California, remember their water year begins in October and uh, ends in October with reaching the end of their wet season right here about the beginning of April. And the normal rate of accumulation of precip is something like this. Well, this event kind of helped end a drier spell in October and most of November. And now we're starting to finally make some progress. But we are currently sitting right on well, with our driest uh, and second driest time periods here back in 76 and 77. So we need a lot more precipitation. I'm going to tell you something. California will be getting it in the near term. And this is how. The flow of the jet stream is doing something like this. And this is going to be basically pushing a lot of very high moisture uh, you know, air into the West Coast here in the next few days. But take a look at this. If you're watching this in the midsection of the United States, this is something you're going to see a whole lot more of than anything else. That is broader, ridging, flatter flow, and therefore 
fewer low pressure systems. I think the next big one's not coming in until next Monday in the midsection of the United States. But we are still dealing with this deeper upper level low sitting in through this area. And as a consequence, the uh, northeastern part of the United States still has another about 18 hours of unsettled weather coming through. You can see that well on our all hazards weather map here, where we still have winter weather advisories, winter storm watches, and winter storm warnings out for a big section of the northeast. Outside of that, Got to go back over to the west coast to see where much of the action is. So the midsection of the country, we've got some time coming up where things can be relatively calm. Just take a quick snapshot here of what we're anticipating from the National Digital Forecast Database as system number one finally exits the east coast. These are uh, snowfall amounts we're anticipating through Wednesday afternoon, but much of this coming here in the next 12 to 18 hours here in the, excuse me, in the northeastern part of the United States. So here it is. Next five days, European model on the left. Uh, we have a European model on the right as well, but one is precip on the left, total accumulated, and on the right, snowfall. And I hope you're looking this, at this in the midsection of the country saying, wow, things are relatively benign. We do have two little shortwaves to watch later on this week. One comes out of Texas, really the panels of Texas and Oklahoma, and it comes over toward parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley. And then we have a little clipper that comes in through this area. What you see here, this is left over early this morning on Monday. And here in the Northeast, that's from the system that's kind of exiting right now. So all the action is back out West and it's gonna take a while for this to really push into the center part of the United States. So total accumulated snowfall, this is the current system leaving. So some light snow in the late overnight hours last night and early this morning, what we're anticipating over the next 12 to 18 hours here. And then all the action comes out to the West after this. And here's how we can see it. This is a map of precipitable water. We're looking for these colors here being higher than normal. California's got one, two, three big events coming here in the next 10 days. And I want to pause it right here to show you the most important feature I'll be talking about in this video. You see the operational models along with the ensembles are forecasting a bit of a change in the Pacific jet stream. Now, when you look at this, yeah, look at the big push of moisture coming in here to California. But what I want you to see is the drier air north of it is not in some deep configuration like this, this highly amplified pattern. It's suggesting that the jet stream is coming much more zonal across the Pacific, and that is going to change everything through the first 15 days of this month of December. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, let's take a look at it with our operational European model run. Starting things off, the low that's just off the coast, still another, you know, at least another uh, 10 to 15 hours, maybe up to 18 hours of snowfall here. Let me show you. If I play this out, that just took you through Tuesday morning right about here. And so by that time, we'll get the last bit of snow coming around the backside. Very windy conditions here, but the last bit of snow coming around. Meanwhile, look at the mid part of the country. There's a whole lot of nothing through Wednesday afternoon. Just some light snow moving through with the Great Lake states toward the northeast, but the midsection of the United States, Thursday afternoon, maybe Thursday evening, we're gonna watch two things. One, a clipper that came out of Manitoba, sneaking right here, just north of Lake Superior, and to the south of it, a little shortwave that sneaks out of the Intermountain West into Oklahoma and Texas. By, well, Friday morning, they've both moved this one's over the lower Mississippi River Valley, and it gets quickly off the southeast coast. And even as we begin our weekend, the midsection of the country, relatively boring until maybe Monday morning, right here. So what's going on out west? We'll take a look at this. Let me take you back. Monday afternoon and evening, first strong onshore flow event, still bringing in the precipitation here. Getting you into Wednesday, that's the next big push right here. Wednesday morning, afternoon and evening. Things are calm for a little bit, and then Friday, midday, evening, Saturday morning, next big low that comes through. So we got three chances in the next five to six days in California for having some strong onshore flow. And what about this system right here next Monday morning? We'll take a look at it when we compare the GFS, which is on the left, to the European, which is on the right. We can see that both models put lower atmospheric pressure in this area with the surface high pressure cell sitting here just almost off the image, which means we are feeding this thing with plenty of moisture. And there is a shortwave coming through there. It's going to help lower the heights and therefore give us a chance at developing a low. So we do have multi-model agreement on this system showing up on next Monday. And we can also see this. The European Ensemble has several of its members putting their lowest pressure inside that corridor as well. 
So for many in the midsection of the country, this will be the next chance that we have at getting some significant precipitation. So we got a week here where if you're not buried in snow, some of this field work could finally get done after we dry out a little bit. So that's what we're looking at here right in the heart of the Corn Belt. But take a look at week two. One thing we are noticing is a much stronger subtropical branch of the jet stream in the east coast of the United States. Both models here, GFS left, European right, staying wet. But why the difference along the west coast? With the European much wetter in the Pacific Northwest, uh, whereas the GFS, look over there here, much drier. Well, let's take a look at those differences by jumping up into the upper levels of the atmosphere. Playing this forward, here comes trough number one, still spinning here uh, off of the... Um, East Coast causing all the problems in the next 18 hours or so. That thing finally gets out of here. And what we're left with behind it, some cooler air in the next several days here in the midsection of the, or excuse me, uh, in the eastern part of the United States. In the midsection, see the ridging building up in both models? That's a relaxation of the pattern. So warmer conditions coming through. Here is the Wednesday cutoff load that sinks into California. Both models resolving it very well. And let me just get you out to Thursday morning and afternoon. Shortwave number one to the north. The clipper system moving through Thursday into Thursday evening into the Great Lakes. Shortwave number two coming out of Texas and Oklahoma, moving over toward parts of the lower Mississippi River Valley. But again, that's going to set up cooler weather east and a lot of cold air tucked away up here in the Hudson Bay. But midsection of the country, things relatively benign. We're going to have to wait till next Monday morning here where the broader trough sweeps through in the GFS. It is also here in the European model, and that's why they agree on the position and timing of that low somewhere over Illinois. Now, this is where things change. You see, as I get you out here to next Tuesday night, so this is December the 11th, look at the much deeper extent of the trough in the GFS, hence colder east, whereas the European tucks that colder air much farther to the north over the Hudson Bay. The other difference is in the Gulf of Alaska. You see, the GFS wants to tighten up a much deeper Aleutian low, therefore bringing more moisture here into British Columbia and Alaska, making it drier along the west coast. Not in the European, much, much stronger west to east flow slamming into the west coast of the United States, therefore much wetter in this area. That's the difference in the models. Meanwhile, midsection of the country, relaxed pattern overall, and therefore when you take a look at these temperatures, well, over the next five days, remember, Trough moves over the east, hence the cool down that we're going to be experiencing there. In days 6 through 10, a lot of that cold air gets tucked away up here in central Canada, just to the west of the Hudson Bay. But days 11 through 15, with the European model bringing in the more zonal flow, well, we just don't see the reason to bring in the much below average temperatures. The GFS, remember, takes that trough that shoves that moisture into British Columbia and then allows much cooler air to kind of sneak here into the eastern half of North America. But overall at this point, I think I'm going to have to favor what the European model is suggesting, namely because of these changes. One, the polar vortex, as we discussed a lot, lot, lot last week, is still dealing with the disruption here over parts of Greenland and north of the Hudson Bay. That's breaking off two pieces of the polar vortex, over the next week, one over parts of Europe, the other over parts of Siberia. So that is one reason why I think the bitterly cold air stays away from the central part of the United States. The second reason, the Indian Ocean Dipole has come off of its peak and slowly over the next uh, six weeks, we'll be going back into what we call neutral territory, which would be in this regime. And what does all that mean? Well, that means the strong upward motion we've been getting here, sitting over Africa, is waning. That means the suppression of the upper level flow in the near term is still strong, but look at what it'll be like by the time we get up to December 15th and 16th. That means this region, Indonesia and Australia, will stop uh, you know, with this pattern that's kept it so remarkably dry. And as this whole thing kind of comes out of this peak phase, it will most certainly be changing the upper level dynamics over South America. So what will we watch? Well, as the Indian Ocean Dipole starts to decay, we'll finally see the Madden Julian Oscillation getting out of phases one and two where it's been stuck and start to move. And one of the things I'm anticipating is this. The cooler water you see tucked in here, which is primarily due to the Indian Ocean Dipole shoving a wind near the surface in that direction and in that direction. Well, when these winds calm down, I expect the waters to warm inside that circle. That will probably let the waters back and through here cool off a bit. It'll also change the ocean temperatures here in Nino region 3.4. 
It won't affect the warm North Pacific very much, but this will change the entire flow pattern out of the Central Pacific. And we'll begin this kind of second cold season pattern that I'm anticipating, which I think will feature a much more zonal jet stream across the Pacific and a strong subtropical jet stream, which is why the East Coast looks so wet. Well, what about South America? To understand South America, look at this global view first. In the next 15 days, biggest changes after that time period will be happening here. All right. And once they begin to happen here, where that dryness goes away, we're going to see changes over in South America. Now, what will it look like? Well, over the next 15 days, we see this dry here, dry here with a wet quarter in between. What I'm anticipating seeing here is that Brazil's northern growing regions could go over to a drier pattern. And if they do, that is not ideal for this time of year, specifically because of the drier than normal conditions we had earlier in the season. In fact, I don't know, I shouldn't call it drier than normal, it was drought. So what we're going to look at here and to see where the current stresses are is the vegetation health index map that's over there on the left. This is comparing a year ago to now. These colors represent worse conditions. These are better. We won't be able to use this map over parts of the southern Amazon parts of Mato Grosso, Rondonia, as we get through the next several weeks. And that's because there's too much cloud cover in the afternoon to allow us to use the NDVI technique to measure what the plant health looks like from space. But what we do notice is that eastern Brazil looks much drier and much and therefore worse in terms of its vegetation health compared to a year ago. And that stretches into Mato Grosso do Sul and over into Paraguay. Where things look okay down here, in parts of Argentina, specifically Cordoba and Santa Fe. But the northern growing regions of Argentina, the western growing regions, and the southern still not looking nearly as good as they have, well, at least compared to a year ago. Where are the biggest changes? Well, this area in through here is getting some much needed rainfall. Down in Argentina, though, things are looking very dry in the coming days, and it's also going to continue to be dry in the region where we already see major stress here. Now, this will be critical as we begin the month of January to see how the Indian Ocean Dipole event collapses and changes everything for both South America and North America. We'll keep you up to date every day throughout the week as this all changes. And with that, I'll go ahead and wrap it up right here. We thank you for your attention. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.